for all the Western concern about Russia's Zapad military exercises, they nonetheless offer a rare insight into developments in the Russian military at a time of significant change. As one of the leading Western analysts of Russian military developments, Roger McDermott says while Russia's armed forces leadership remain very interested in military theory, they test and rehearse new approaches to warfare and strategic exercises. Thus, he adds, exercises like Zapa offer glimpses into the real level of capability and demand careful and sober assessment for outsiders. Russia claims this exercise falls below a treaty threshold of 13,000 soldiers that would require invitations to be issued to observer teams from other European nations. Western analysts place the numbers involved much higher. But even without full scale observer teams, Zapit is being monitored closely by NATO countries using satellites and aircraft with radars that can reach into Western Russia to get a clear sense of how Russian and Belarusian forces perform. These exercises come at an interesting moment. The Russian military is transitioning from the old Cold War style Red Army into a more modern and flexible force, capable of conducting combined operations across land, sea, and air, tailored to a variety of potential scenarios, just like the more sophisticated of NATO armies. Igor Sutyagin, the senior research fellow for Russian studies at the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, RUSI, think tank in London, describes this as an attempt to create a lean, fully manned, combat-ready force, fully, or to the best possible extent, equipped with the up-to-date equipment and supported by agile rear infrastructure. Despite Russia's victory in the brief Georgia War of 2008, the conflict showed up many shortcomings. And Western analysts will be watching the Zapid maneuvers closely to see how the Russian general staff is applying the lessons learned from more recent operations in Syria and eastern Ukraine. Dr. Sutyagin told me, both campaigns showed the general direction in which the Russian military is moving. But how far has Russia's military transition really gone? And, crucially, will the Russian government continue to have sufficient funds to maintain its military modernization plans? Dr. Sutyagin says the transition has passed the middle of its long path, with organizational changes nearing their completion. However, there have been some indications of backsliding, with a return to the establishment of large army divisions which, he says, are hard to man, thus being to a large extent empty shells. Rearmament with modern weaponry, necessary to closed, or at the minimum, narrow, the technological gap between the Russian and the best Western military forces is also gaining momentum. But Dr. Sutyagin says much of the new equipment budget may now be in question, as completion of the rearmament program depends on both availability of finances and access to Western technologies, which is becoming harder. In terms of the Zapid exercises themselves, there is much to look for. In theory, these are defensive exercises, organizing the defense of Russia and Belarus against an external attack. This of course has not prevented some spectacular firepower demonstrations, not least the firing of an Iskander M missile from a range in southwest Russia against a mock target in Kazakhstan, a flight of some 480 kilometers, 300 miles.
But in terms of the exercises themselves, what will NATO watchers be looking for? Mr. McDermott says it will be worth examining the use of strike systems in the exercise, because since the last Zafat in 2013, Moscow has magnified the role of conventional precision strike in its set of coercive tools. In a groundbreaking study of Russia's use of what it calls high-precision weapons, precision-guided munitions or PGMs in the West, recently published by the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, Mr. McDermott and his co-author, Tor Buckville, set out the history and development of Russia's interest in this category of weapon. Long-range cruise missiles, both air and sea-launched, were first used by the Russians in combat in the conflict in Syria. It is interesting that while much of the Western media discussion of PGMs rests upon their use as air-launched weapons in bombing campaigns intended to increase accuracy and reduce the level of civilian casualties, in Russia the weapons are viewed in a rather different light. Mr. McDermott's study concludes that for the foreseeable future, precision-guided munitions will mainly provide Russia with what in the Russian literature is called a pre-nuclear deterrence capability. Note the Iskander M launch in this exercise. This is basically just another layer of deterrence in addition to the nuclear weapons, but is still seen as being of vital importance by the Russian military. This has been on display during the fighting in eastern Ukraine and has impressed many NATO commanders. They fear that, while their forces have had a lengthy gap in serious training for high-intensity conflict to fight counterinsurgency campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, Russia has been steadily improving its forces. U is a case in point. Iana recently published study for the International Center for Defense on Security in Estonia, Mr. McDermott said, Russia's growing technological advances in U will allow its forces to jam, disrupt and interfere with NATO communications, radar and other sensor systems, unmanned aerial vehicles and other assets. This capability, he said, risk negating advantages conferred on NATO by its technological edge. Many of those systems, he said, are being introduced in units across all services stationed in Russia's western military district adjacent to NATO's borders. Russia sees U as a seamless hold, ranging from kinetic combat operations on the battlefield to missions in cyberspace and the information domain. Indeed this may be the area where the Russian military is breaking the newest ground, having as it does a far less clearly defined sense of the boundary line between war and peace. It is in this gray area of warfare that Moscow is leveraging its abilities. As such, it poses fundamental political and military challenges to NATO countries, in whose strategic outlook war and peace tend to assume.